Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's BI-327 Histology course lecture on the integumentary system. Uh, the integumentary system is basically the skin, and in part one of this lecture series, we're going to take a look at the general characteristics. As with all of these lectures, please review the objectives um, that are listed uh, because they'll provide you with a good set of study focusing questions and also help you to determine what are the important concepts associated uh, with this uh, lecture series. Now the integument or skin is going to be the largest and the heaviest organ within the body and it comprises about 16 percent of the total body weight and it forms a complete surface over complete external surface over the entire body. It's going to have a wide range of functions uh, and the functions are basically break down into two different categories. The first category is that it, it has a protective mechanism. So we've got uh, a relatively susceptible, a vulnerable uh, body that has to be protected against the outside world. Uh, and so we take a look at that. We need to protect against microorganisms, uh, disease-causing materials uh, that can be picked up uh, that want to become established in a uh, nutrient-rich environment, which would be the body. Uh, try to minimize exposure to toxic substances that we come into contact with uh, in our daily lives. Uh, recognizing that uh, our cells are all aqueous, that we have uh, the cells within an aqueous extra, uh, extracellular matrix or interstitial fluid, we got to try to avoid dehydration, uh, excess loss of water. We need to protect ourselves from ultraviolet radiation, uh, essentially sunlight, which would have the effect of damaging the DNA of our cells. Uh, we also need to have uh, protection against impact and friction. You know, if we bump into things, we fall, we you know, brush up against things, uh, we don't want to essentially leave body parts behind. And so we have a wide range of functions for protection associated with the skin. The skin is also going to serve as an interface between our body and the external world. And so there are going to be specialized structures involved with sensory reception to determine what's going on, you know, what, what are we touching, what's the temperature outside the world. Uh, it has a role in excretion, so um, essentially we have sweat glands associated with uh, the skin that are going to be important for excreting materials as well as regulating body temperature. It's going to be important for vitamin D metabolism, again related to kind of the beneficial ways, uh, beneficial properties uh, associated with sunlight. And then finally, the skin, because it is so large and uh, it is that interface between the body and the surrounding world, uh, is going to be important for the regulation of both blood pressure and body temperature. Now, if we take a look at the skin, or you know, the scientific term, the integument, what we're going to see is it's going to be uh, composed of three layers. So starting out at the outermost layer, we're going to have an epidermis. And the epidermis is essentially going to be primarily a maximally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Underlying that, we're going to have a dermis, which is going to be a connective tissue. And there's actually going to be two regions within the dermis. There's going to be a loose connective tissue immediately under the epidermis. And this is going to be uh, the papillary layer of the dermis. And then deeper to that, we're going to have a dense, irregular connective tissue, kind of a woven uh, kind of collection of uh, collagen fibers, which are going to provide some strength and integrity uh, to the integument to the skin. And then deeper to that, and I said the integument is composed of three layers. It's actually composed of two layers, but we're going to include the hypodermis at this point because the hypodermis is not uh, officially part of the skin, uh, but it's going to be the boundary between the skin and the rest of the body. Uh, it's going to be essentially also known as the subcutaneous fascia, but it's going to be a lot of white adipose tissue. We take a look at the epidermis. We said it was going to be a maxly keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So many cell layers thick, surface cells are going to be flat, they're going to be the squamous cells, and maximally keratinized. So we're going to have lots of those intermediate filaments, the keratin intermediate filaments, they're going to provide strength to these cells. Uh, it's also important to recognize that the surface cells, the cells closest to the outside of the body, uh, are going to be in essence dead. All they're going to be is remnants of cells that are still packed with keratin to give them strength and resistance. If we take a look at the cells found within the epidermis, there are going to be four uh, primary cell types. The keratinocytes are going to be the major cell. They're going to be the ones that are producing this stratified squamous epithelium. And so they're going to be involved for both the structure of the skin as well as many of the protective mechanisms associated with it. 
we're going to have another category of cells being the melanocytes. And we'll talk about all, all of these cells in greater detail as we go through. But the melanocytes are essentially specialized cells that are going to be important for protecting the cells of the skin and protecting the body from uh, ultraviolet radiation. And then finally, we're going to have two categories of cells that are much rarer and very difficult to identify, especially in light microscopy. The first of these are Langerhans cells, and the Langerhans cells are going to be an example of an antigen-presenting cell. So it's a cell that's essentially going to be sampling the environment, picking up materials, and then presenting them to lymphocytes um, to see essentially if there are foreign materials that we need to mount an immune response to. And then finally, the last of the cells within the epidermis are going to be the Merkel cells, and these are an example of a sensory receptor cell. If we take a look at the integument uh, and focus in on the epidermis, focus in on that outermost layer, we're going to see that there are five layers within the epidermis. And we're actually going to start at the lowest level. We're going to start um, at the bottom of the epidermis, the bottom of the epithelium, where it's sitting upon the uh, basement membrane or the basal lamina, and it's essentially right above the, the dermis. And that base level is going to be called the stratum basale or the stratum germinativum. And so what we're going to have in this region is a single layer of cuboidal cells. And then many of these cells are essentially going to be stem cells. They're going to be cells that are going to be capable of dividing so that an individual can continue to produce skin uh, through their entire lifetime. Above that, we're going to have the stratum spinosum, essentially a, a relatively thick layer. The cells hold together with, held together with desmosomes, and we're going to see that throughout the entire epidermis. But the cells are going to have kind of a spiny appearance because when we're preparing them for histological examination, they dehydrate a little bit, but they're still attached to one another. So as the cell shrinks, we're going to see the cell body shrinking, but the points where they're connected to the neighboring cells are going to remain. So it's going to give a kind of a spiny or star-shaped appearance. Above that, we're going to have the stratum granulosum. Within the stratum granulosum, we're going to have a, a layer of essentially granular cells, cells with a lot of granules, and they're actually going to be basophilic, keratohyaline granules, and we'll talk about what's in there uh, in the next lecture. <clears throat> but essentially, it's going to have a really granular, really basophilic uh, appearance to that. Above that is the stratum lucidum, essentially a translucent layer, which is often going to be difficult to uh, see or locate in a lot of specimens. Recognize that it's there, but it may not be visible. And then finally, we've got the stratum corneum. That's the outermost layer, that's the surface layer of the skin, and this is going to be non-nucleated cells, so essentially dead cells, cell remnants, which are packed with the keratin intermediate filament. So again, the cytoskeletal elements, elements are, are still going to be there, they're going to be providing strength and integrity, uh, but we're looking at, in essence, dead cells. Now there are two ways of looking at classifying uh, the skin. Uh, we could have thick skin or thin skin. In thick skin, uh, all five layers of the epidermis should be relatively uh, observable, relatively easy to observe, and it's going to be prevalent in that we're going to have a very thick stratified corneum, that uh, maximally keratinized layer on the outer surface of the skin. We're going to find a thick skin on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, so locations where we're going to be subject to uh, a lot of abrasion, a lot of uh, essentially impact and, and, and force on it. Uh, the epidermis uh, in the thick skin can any, be anywhere from about 400 to 600 micrometers uh, in thickness. In contrast, thin skin is going to be much thinner, about 75 to 150 micrometers in diameter. Uh, it's going to cover the rest of the body, so basically the entire body except for the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. And it's still going to have all five layers, but you're probably not going to be able to observe the stratum lucidum uh, with at least light microscopy. And the major difference is that when you take a look at it, the stratum corneum is going to be very, very thin within uh, the thin skin. The other way of classifying skin is going to be the presence or absence uh, of skin. And so vellus skin, in essence, is going to be a skin which has hair. And it could be, and we'll talk about hair in one of the, the upcoming lectures, but in essence, it's going to be thin skin with a lot of hair follicles located within it. In contrast, glabrous skin is going to be hairless skin. And again, that's going to be the thick skin that's found on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Okay, so if we take a look at this, the major component within 
the epidermis are going to be the keratinocytes. And again, it's important to recognize that it's going to start there in the stratum ocelli, that base level, sitting upon the basement membrane, sitting upon the basal lamina, right above the connective tissue, where the cells are going to divide. Some of the cells are going to stay within the stratum ocelli, but other ones are going to be pushed up into the epidermis. And as they move up through the epidermis, they're going to differentiate. And as they differentiate, they're going to become mature uh, skin cells and ultimately become dead remnants of cells, maximally keratinized cells, that are going to be sloughed off on the surface of the skin. Uh, they're going to divide uh, the stem cells in the stratum ocelli are going to divide estimated about once every 19 days uh, under normal circumstances. If you're looking at uh, wound recovery, if you've got a scrape or if you've got a cut, it will trigger more rapid cell division. And then basically the cells are going to move up through the epi epi epidermis, the epithelium, uh, within say two weeks to two months from when they're born, essentially within the stratum ocelli, to when they're sloughed off uh, off of the surface of the skin. Now one of the major characteristics associated with these cells is the fact that they are part of this maximally keratinized epithelia. And so the tonofibrils, essentially the cytoskeletal elements that are composed of the cytokeratin, are going to be very, very important. And so when we're taking a look at this, the tonal filaments are going to start to appear within the stratum ocelli. So as soon as the cells are done dividing and they start to differentiate, what we're going to see is that they're going to start producing the tonal filaments. They're going to start uh, producing uh, the elements involved with establishing that maximally keratinized cytoskeleton within uh, the, the cell itself. As the cells push up into the epithelium, we're going to start, once we get up to uh, the stratum granulosum, we're going to start to see the formation of those keratohyaline granules, those very basophilic structures that we talked about before. Now, the granules are going to be containing free polysomes. And again, recognize that the polysomes are going to be, in essence, messenger RNA associated with ribosomes. So we're going to be producing lots of proteins, which are going to be used within the cytoplasm. In essence, they're going to be used for the formation of the cytoskeleton. They're going to be used for the pro production of a mature form of keratin. And so what these polysomes are going to be producing is uh, histidine-rich, cysteine-rich uh, proteins, which are going to be, in essence, things like filigrin precursors. And so these are essentially molecules that are going to interact with our tonal filaments and our tonal fibrils in the formation of mature keratin when these things come together. And so, again, within the upper reaches of the stratum spinosum and definitely within the stratum granulosum, we're going to be able to see these keratohyaline granules because of the intense basophilic staining appearance as they're producing these components to form mature keratin. Now, the final component process of the keratinization, the production of the keratin, is that the filigrin precursors break down to give us filigrin. The filigrin and the other proteins are going to come together to give us tonal filaments, so essentially come together with all of these other things, the materials within the keratohyaline granules, the tonal fibrils coming together, and it's going to produce a soft form of keratin. And this is going to be occurring within the stratum lucidum, so that by the time the cells push up into the stratum corneum, they're going to have a very, very strong cytoskeleton. They're going to have a very, very strong form of keratin within their cytoplasm. Now, this is going to be a similar process to what's happening in your hair and in your nails. But the difference is, instead of soft keratin, we're going to have a hard keratin being formed. And it's the same basic type of thing, but it's going to be much more highly cross-linked. And that amorphous uh, keratin is going to have a lot more sulfur, which is going to give it the properties uh, associated with the hardness of a nail, as opposed to kind of the strength and integrity, but still flexibility associated with the outer surface of the skin. And that's going to finish up uh, our first lecture in this series on the integument around the skin. I'll come back for part two, and we're going to look at more details associated with the epidermis. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.